Oh, you get to like, you know, have the accolades, right? Um, okay, so here we go. Um, the first thing I want to do is to thank my incredible collaborators. So I think Walter Clark had to scoot out, uh, but he is, we just owe him such a debt of gratitude for making this whole thing happen. Um, and also to my colleague Antoni, who is not here, but is, is very present. And I want to thank my incredible collaborators um, in this presentation. So this is Ana de la Paz. Uh, she, you're, I don't need to say much about her because you're going to see for yourself in just a minute. And um, we also want to thank our third collaborator, Elizabeth Torres Aguilera, who was not able to make the trip today, but she also made a tremendous contribution to our research. Um, and I want to note that Aurelia Martin Casare, digo, este, Aurelia Pesarradona and Mari, Maria Jose Ruiz Mayordomo were not able to make it today at the last minute. Um, so I'm sorry about that. I know that we're all very disappointed not to be able to hear their research on the Canario. Um, and when we found that out, we decided, Ana and I, to take 45 minutes. So go to the bathroom if you need to, you know, be ready. Okay. <laughs> Those of you that know me know that a big uh, goal in my life is to translate Spanish sources to English. And there's just a lot of information in this presentation that we really wanted to get out to you. Um, and I want to note that except for the Esquivel, on whom we rely, of course, on Lynn Brooks, uh, except for Cervantes and the Carpentier quotes, all the translations from the Spanish sources that we're going to give you today are mine. And the research that we're presenting today is um, from my forthcoming book, Sonidos Negros, forthcoming from Oxford University Press. Look for it next year. Um, OK. We're going to be speaking today about an early modern Spanish dance called the Villano. Performed in Christmas pageants, this shepherd's dance told the story of a bumpkin shepherd who eventually saw the light of Christ and was redeemed. Because the Villano contains the narrative of redemption, it was also a tool of evangelization and thus of the process of colonization of the Americas. This narrative was staged throughout the New World. We will argue today that despite the Villano's evangelical purpose, we may also delineate the contestations of race, the subversion and resignification of dance language, and resistance to colonization in the Villano and its descendants, such as the Guaracha. We will review the sources for the Villano and consider them in terms of their social context, theatrical performance, aristocratic dancing schools, and popular or street performance. And what we see is a tendency toward differentiated styles of the Villano making reference to social class. So the aristocratic or more refined style seems to emphasize jumping, whereas the low or more peasant style seems to emphasize percussive footwork. The 17th century villanos are universally spoken of as having gambetas and zapatetas. That is, gambetas are gambols or jumps, and zapatetas are a hit of the foot, um, a hit of the hand on the foot of the shoe, jumping at the same time as a sign of joy, cabrioles and stumps. Unlike percussive, there's more to come. Unlike percussive footwork, jumps became part of a dancer's training in the aristocratic context. So that's a difference. So what are the characteristic steps of the villano in this more aristocratic context? The boleo is a flying step. It's a cabriole, a high jump with legs beating and the body rotating in the air. It's very difficult, and it requires training. The puntapié is a jumped kick, which is characteristic of the villano's unique bow. And we will relate this step to the bakunao, which is part of a flirtatious dance game that's found throughout the African diaspora. We think of the guaracha as Cuban, but our earliest source for the guaracha comes from 17th century Mexico. Cuba and Mexico were, of course, linked by the slave trade. Havana, I don't need to tell you this, was founded as a place to make port with booty on the way back to Europe, and many enslaved Africans made port in Havana before going on to Veracruz and other ports of New Spain. 
So what we believe that we're seeing in the Guaracha, which is what we're, our con we're gonna conclude with, as a syncretism of Iberian, African, and Native American dances, is number one, that um, noisy villano footwork slash jumping, because we're kind of looking at them together. And these sexy bakunaos are twin aspects of a widely dispersed complex of, mu of movement ideas, um, which Garcia de Leon Griego calls cumbe, and of course we all know those cumbe dances, right? Um, for example, in the Peruvian samacueca and Cuban zapateo, footwork seems to stake out the more white or decent side of the spectrum, while the bacunao is always perceived by Europeans as being indecent and black. The other thing we think we're seeing in the Guaracha as a syncretic form is that Africanist dance ideas such as the Vacunao and what Constance Vallis Hill calls drum dances seem to be continually circulating back to the Iberian Peninsula where we find them in the 18th century tonadillas. And of course, I'm ignorant about all of the incredible you know, Native American dances but I'm learning from you, and I know that it makes me wonder whether this work is not also um, going to yield a lot of insight about you know, what these presences are on, and we'll give you a little bit of proposals in a, in a bit. Elegua, the gatekeeper, is a divinity known as Legba and Ashu. He is found throughout the African diaspora. He's also found throughout West and Central Africa. He's found in Brazil, Cuba, Puerto Rico, DR, Panama, Venezuela, Colombia, IT, and the United States. Anthropologist Melville Herskovitz says, like Ba everywhere dances in the manner of a man copulating, and that is with this pelvic thrust. This is the bakunao of these, uh, these dance games. And we are going to argue today that, uh, Leg that Legba is also present in Spanish dances. Okay, so. Let's back up and tell you a bit about our research process. Uh, in the 16th and 17th century, Spain, footwork was used in two dances, the Canario and the Villano. The Canario's footwork was a representation of ca Canary Islanders, or as our bow writes in 1589, kings and queens of Mauritania, or else like savages in feathers dyed to many a hue. The Villano was a representation of villagers, or peasants, in the villano, noisy footwork often represented unselfconscious confusion, the innocent and joyful dance of shepherds. It was often danced in nativity plays and Christmas pageants. As Javier Irigoyen Garcia powerfully argues in his book, Pastoral Discourse and Ethnicity in Early Modern Spain, the shepherd danced in the villano has lived in the Spanish imaginary as an emblem of the limpieza de sangre, purity of blood that underlies today's ideas about race. The shepherd is a representation of an idealized community cleansed of cultural and biological traces of Moorish and Jewish Iberia. The shepherd in this portrait is King Felipe III, the theme of the adoration of Christ promoted Catholic catechiz catechization of the most humble social classes, including those enslaved. In the context of debates over limpieza de sangre, blood purity, this painting commemorates the decision of Felipe III to expel the moriscos, Spanish subjects of Mus Muslim lineage whose families had converted to Christianity, which was carried out in 1609. The Spanish Portuguese tambo, anglicized as tambo, was, in the system of racial categories that govern Spanish colonial society, a person of mixed African and Amerindian heritage. Flamencos find this interesting because we have great Roma artists whose nickname is tambo, Los Sambos from Jerez. The word zapateado comes from the word zapato or shoe. In the first monolingual dictionary of Spanish, Sebastián de Covarrubias in 1611 elucidates the metaphorical logic linking noisy footwork with the villano as a paradigm of redemption, defining zapato, spelled zapato so don't look for it in the Z's, 
in a lengthy dissertation as the most humble thing there is, worn under the foot, and thus symbolic of the humility and lowliness of Christ the Redeemer. From this association flow a number of somewhat surprising glosses, such as, to get into a shoe is to be afraid, and to shoe someone or zapatear someone is to punish him in word or in deed. Zapatear is to dance, hitting the palms of the hands on the feet and the shoes, on the shoes, to the tune of some instrument, and that person is called a zapateador. Zapatetas are those hits to the shoes. Rodrigo Caro, a priest and scholar who in, around 1626 wrote a book about children's games and folk customs called Dias Geniales, also sees zapatetas as synonymous with the villano. Caro quotes Ezekiel's prophecy from the Old Testament. Because you have clapped your hands and stamped your feet, rejoicing with all the malice of your heart against the land of Israel. Caro writes that this must have been a dance playing castanets, doing zapatetas and gambetas, or capers, as in the villano. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Caro took a much dimmer view of the Spanish sarabanda, which at French court became the saraband, described by Spanish moralist Juan de Mariana in 1583 as being sufficient to inflame even quite well-behaved people representing in public the most stupid and dirty acts that are done in bordellos, representing kisses and embraces and everything else with the mouth and arms, thighs and the whole body. It seems that the devil has brought these lascivious dances from hell, and the insolence that in, in the Gentile Republic was not tolerated is viewed with applause and pleasure by Christians, unconcerned by the ruin of their customs and the sweet poison, for it kills at least the soul of lasciviousness and dishonesty that the youth gently drink. And it is not only one dance, but many, to, to the extent that it seems there is a great la uh, as great a lack of names as there is a surfeit of dishonesties. Such were the sarabanda, and a huge troop of this ilk which the ministers of idleness, musicians, poets, and actors invent each day without punishment. We will return to the Sarabanda presently. I know, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> let's see, can we go like this? Is that better? Okay. Okay, in 1739, the Dictionary of the Royal Spanish Academy, RAE, followed Covarrubias of 1611 in defining zapateado as the dance done with footwork, zapateando. RAE defines zapateta with the same meaning as had Covarrubias in 1611, that is, the hit or clap of the hand on the foot or shoe, adding and illustrating this with an example from Cervantes' Quixote, um, jumping at the same time as hitting the shoe with the hand as a sign of jubilation. <laughs> so aside from this jubilation in the revelation of the coming of Christ, RAE in, in 1739 contains six definitions of the verb zapatear, all of which can be read through this lens of Christian evangelization, including to hit someone with a shoe, to shake someone up in word or deed, to trip over something or run into something, and in dance to accompany the music by beating the hands together or hitting the hands one at a time on the feet, which are left, lifted to this end in various postures, always following the same rhythm and most frequently used in the dance called the piano. RAE gives a Latin definition which means to dance with frequent lifting and striking shoe and an illustration from Quixote in which Sancho Panza, speaking to Don Quixote, emphasizes the difference between zapateado as a dance of rustic innocence and cultivated aristocratic dances. Sancho says, in an evil hour you took to dancing, mastermind. Do you think all mighty men of valor are dancers and all knights errant given to capering? If you do, I can tell you, you are mistaken. There's many a man would rather undertake to kill a giant than cut a caper. If it had been the shoe fling, zapateo, you were at, I could take your place, for I can do the shoe fling like a head falcon, which is some kind of a falcon, but I'm no good at dancing.
In Spanish performance of the 16th and 18th centuries, the villano and the shepherd, whose noisy confusion gives way to revelation and redemption in nativity plays and Christmas carols, villancicos, is performed using zapateado. In the villancicos, Christmas carols, which are also theatricals performed in churches, there are examples in Spanish literature of both gentlemanly and rude villanos. An illustration of a sacramental villano is a loa, praise song by Agustin Rojas, written between 1601 and 1603. The characters enter and sing and dance a villano, and the loa includes the villano's characteristic estribillo or chorus, a didactic couplet about the Eucharist. Hoy al hombre se lo dan a Dios vivo en cuerpo y pan. Today is given to man, God alive, in body and bread. Illustrious Spanish theater historian, historian Emilio Cotarello y Mori cites a 1618 account of a fiesta in which this estribillo appears with villano substituted for hombre. Al villano que le dan, etc., which Cotarello calls a letra tan zapateado, a verse so, so done, often done with footwork. Cotarello gives another common variation on this estribillo from Luis Briceño's 1626 treatise on Spanish guitar, al villano que le dan la cebolla con el pan. The villager is given onions with his bread. The estribillo easily acquires a sarcastic tone, commenting not on the miraculous gift of redemption, but rather on the fact that villanos must work, must work for their bread and may not have enough to eat. In her magisterial Nuevo Corpus de la Antigua Lírica Popular Hispánica, siglos XV a XVII, for example, folklorist Margit Frenca La Torre lists another couplet from Briseño's 1626 villano. Al villano testarudo dan le pan y azote crudo. To the hard-headed villano, they give bread and a good beating. But let's get back to our sources. The earliest villano we found is in Cesare Negri's treatise Le Gratie de Amore from 1602. While early modern Spanish dances such as the Zarabanda, Chacona, and Canario were widespread in European courts, the villano was not. However, Negri's Villanico was danced in his school in Milan, which from 1550 to 1602 was under Spanish domination. In 1642, we find information about the villano in Juan de Esquivel's Discurso sobre el Arte del Danzado. While most of the aristocratic dances treated in Esquivel's discursos begin with a courtly and elegant bow, Esquivel describes the villano's unusual opening bow, in which the dancer, having removed his hat from his, with two, from his head with two hands, kicks his leg up to touch the hat before returning the hat to his head and his leg to the floor. Esquivel describes a spectacular jump, the boleo or boleo, as a punta pie. The boleo, characteristic of the villano, is a kick done by lifting the foot as high as possible and stretching the legs well. Esquivel says that the boleo is performed flying through the air. Lynn Brooks translates boleo as a hurtling step, a flying leap turn, about which Esquivel colorfully remarks that some have knocked themselves flat on their backs attempting this feat, and that while performing this step, one adept kicked a lamp hanging two handspans above his head. And you can see in this illustration from 1602 Negri that here's a dancer practicing to get his leg higher and higher by kicking a tassel, and the tassel's raised higher and higher until it's two hand spans above the head. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about um, the voleo and the discovery about the step and, and the difficulty about it. So we were looking at Esquivel and um, when describing this, this rotated beat step that is, you know, the, the leg kicked super high. And we were in the studio, and they, it was described as a step. And I'm going to try to demonstrate. So, do it without the microphone. Um, so you're you're supposed to lift off the left leg, kick the right leg in the air, jumping, beating. So beat like this, and then rotate. <laughs> and the first time we were reading it, Elizabeth, 
And this is, okay, this is, okay, not me, but her. Look at her. And also, the, uh, the other dancer that was in the studio with us is also a highly trained, ballet, ballet, balletically trained dancer. So we're looking at this, but we have how do you beat, and in fact, they were saying beat and maybe even cross. So I'm beating like this, and you know, I'm kneading my, my left leg under my right, and then rotating. The and they said it could go 100, it, I mean 360, like it could go all the way around. <laughs> cool, thanks. Yeah, okay. All right, so. Um, Lindbrook says that a puntapié for Esquivel is a batillo or a kick. It's kind of like a batman. RAE defines a puntapié as a hit given with the toes. And we think that the salient difference between a batillo and a puntapié is that the puntapié hits something like a tassel or like the hat. Puntapié seems to be a more generic term for a jumped kick, while the boleo described by Esquivel is much more difficult, as we saw, and involves a rotation of the body in the air. Brooks thinks Esquivel's boleo may be similar to the Italian salto del fioco, which we've learned so much about from Linda Tomko's work, recorded in Genaro Magri's 1779 chapter on cabrioles. And just to you know, note for those of you who are not familiar, this is a, a treatise for professional dancers. The 1779 is for professional dancers. So these capers and cabrioles are intricate jumps performed by crossing or passing the legs in the air. They're very difficult and require strength and training and are often used as a competition among dancers for the greatest agility and strength. Esquivel and Minguet, who we'll meet in just a minute, have three and four versions of the cabriole respectively, and the Italian and French sources have similar descriptions as well. These jumps are reminiscent also of the Basque folk dances, which click the heels in the air and which are also a test of virility and strength. And we have no idea whether there's any relationship here, but the Basques do pride themselves on the purity of their blood and that the fact that the Islamic armies that, at, that invaded the peninsula in 710 never made it up that far. Cotarello references a chronicle of a visit from the Prince of Wales to Spain in 1623, describing a lavish party in his honor where many cabrioles were performed in competition followed by dancing with castanets. In view of the racialized overtones of the Llanos narrative of redemption, we thought it fascinating to note that while the jumps are associated with the innocent joy of shepherds, the word capriol derives from the word cabra or goat. In Spain, to be como una cabra is to be crazy, but the goat also has a sinister layer of meaning. In medieval occultism, the goat has a lascivious, as is a lascivious animal representing the devil. For Christians, the goat is a symbol of the Antichrist, as depicted in Goya's painting, which is Sabbath of 1798. Domingo Gonzalez, a contemporary of Esquivel, also contains a Villano choreography. His treatise, which Ana Yepes dates to 1650, was written as an instruction manual for distinguished gentlemen, thus confirming the fact that the Villano was danced by the aristocracy. In the opening bow, the dancer takes his hat off, stomping the foot, the floor with the left foot, while holding the hat and doing a puntapié with the right foot, <laughs> kicking the hat. Gonzalez includes castanets in his choreography of the villano, and he specifies that they are played with the arms low without movement. I'm going to take you through uh, this process just a little bit. We, we, we agreed, Anna and I agreed, that it was not necessary to the narrative that we're presenting today, but we thought it might be fun for you, and we thought it was very fun. So this is like a moment in our, a window into our process. So last, uh, the last conference that we did, um, the work I did with, with Thomas Baird, we looked at jaque, which is a manual 
Um, literally, a manual comes from the Spanish word mano, or something that you would have in your pocket when you're in the studio, like to record the dances. So this was a manual written in 1680 for a Spanish aristocrat. And I knew from my work the last time that Jaque has a villano. So that was the first place we went. We looked at uh, Jaque's villano of 1680. And we were reading through it. And we don't find this boleo. We don't find the puntapié. We don't find this kind of characteristic bow of the villano that Esquivel tells us we're supposed to look for. Um, so we actually asked Ana Yepes about that. And she said that. Um, that Jaque is kind of an overview. He gives us kind of an overview that might be for an aristocratic you know, dance student, and it might be something done on a theater stage. So he sort of combines a lot of different characteristics of the villano, and that's what we see. So we got a little bit disenamored of, of Jaque at that point. And I knew from, from Ruiz Mayordomo and from uh, Yepes that this Gonzalez manuscript of 1650 existed. And guess what? I found it online. So that was the first big thing. And then I'm reading through this manual, and I see that it has a villano. So that was the second big thing. OK, and then here we are. So now you can picture we're in the studio in New York, and we're all, all three huddled over this thing, right, and trying to figure out what it says. So I'm going to read this to you. Um, Advertencia, a la cortesía en este tañido y no en otro, se quita el sombrero con entre ambas manos, aún, we don't know what this word is, dando antes y al principio del tañido una, 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 una patadita, thank you, en el suelo con el pie siniestro, volviendo el perfil izquierdo delante, quitándose el sombrero, um, levantando este otro pie de punta a pie y dando con la punta de él en el sombrero. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, and I just, I'm going to show you like how hard this, I mean, you can. Tiempo, the word we don't know is tiempo. It's tiempo? Yeah. Oh my God. Thank you, Craig. <laughs> you see, it takes a village. <laughs> Thank you, Craig. OK, so um, I'm going to just show you. I thought this would be charming to show you our, this page of our notes. Um, Advertencia, la, can't figure out what that is. Co, can't figure out what that is. En este tañido, no en otro, se quita el sombrero con entre ambas manos. So we deciphered this. It says, in this music and not in any other, you take off the hat with two hands. So that was, that was promising. Dando antes y al principio del tañido una patadita en el suelo con el pie siniestro, volviendo el perfil izquierdo. This is my comment to Elizabeth. Thank you, because it might be an indication of it being a theatrical dance. So you turn your profile to who, right? Um, y quitándose el sombrero. Thanks, Ana, for figuring out what that little plus sign in the arrow meant to look in the margin for that note. Um, <laughs> Levantando este otro pie de punta a pie, or does this go with the next line? Y dando con la punta de él en el sombrero sosteniendo sobre el otro. Wow, 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 wow. Okay, so there we have, <laughs> there we have 1650, Domingo Gonzalez. We have this punta a pie that Esquivel tells us is characteristic of the uh, villano. Okay, so the Gonzalez villano is titled Villano Caballero por lo Bajo, which roughly translates as gentleman villano in the low style. As Benjamin Liu describes in his work on medieval serranillas, before 1492, when there were encounters between Muslim raiders and shepherds along the Christian Muslim border in Andalusia, in order to repopulate frontier line, lands, livestock owners were granted privileges and titles of nobility in exchange for taking the obligation to defend their territories from Muslim raids. Irigoyen adds, these newly minted nobles were called caballeros villanos, commoner knights or nobles, an apparent oxymoron that underscores that the combination of sheep herding and the fight against the Muslim was one of the instances in which the expansion of Christian kingdoms to the south allowed for social mobility. We found it fascinating to learn from Gonzalez's 1650 Villano Caballero that a generation after the 1609 expulsion of the Moriscos from Spain, this conundrum of gentlemanly Villano was the lingua franca of aristocratic dance academies. 
Our next reference for the Villano comes from Pablo Minguet Eido's 1737 short treatise on Spanish steps. Minguet, pu Minguet published these treatises on Spanish dance all the way through the 1760s, and he basically plagiarizes Esquivel for these, so we see the continuity in movement vocabulary from 1642 to, sev to 1764. The 1737 edition of Minguet, which is available online from the Library of Congress, gives a complete choreography for a villano. Like Gonzalez in 1650, Minguet's, 17, Minguet's in 1737 omits the boleo that was that really complicated turned rotated cabriole that was described by Esquivel in 1642. But Minguet does include a step called puntillazo, which is a jumped kick similar to the kick to the hat in Esquivel's and Gonzalez's bow, and it, which is used several times in the dance toward the end of each variation. Felipe Rojo de Flores' 1793 treatise on recreational dance lists cabriolas or cabrioles, taconeos or heel work, and zapatetas, a hit or slap of the hand on the shoe as we saw, as fundamental elements for the preparation or training for Spanish dance. Okay, so there's a step in, in Escuela Bolera and the folkloric dance is called the lazos. Um, okay, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do it really well with the in on the carpet but it's this rotation in and out of the of the foot of the feet um, potatoes? maybe they're like mashed potatoes I don't know uh, or yes I or maybe <laughs> or Charles, yeah that so this interweaving step um, that I I'm, I'm pretty fascinated by that the fact that the Bach dances have these jumps uh, steps that are cabrioles horizontally they're like entrechats um, and vertical, the cabrioles that are vertical, and I one day will go in that direction. Mm -hmm. and research that. <laughs> but again, these are the interweaving steps that are characteristic of Spanish. And just uh, for you, Constance, I just want to say that. One, one other thing I'm really proud of about this conference is that I, I've roped this one into dance scholarship <laughs> too. <laughs> uh, okay, so the 1793 treatise. Um, of Rojo de Flores um, is actually the first mention we saw in a dance manual of the Huaracha. And it's also the first time we saw percussive footwork, taconeos and zapatetas, listed among the formal techniques of Spanish dance training. If Rodrigo Caro in 1626 saw zapatetas as synonymous with the villano, in 1793, Rojo de Flores sees gambetas and cabrioles, or jumping, as equivalent to taconeos and zapatetas, or footwork. And further, he sees all of these interweavings and interlacings of the feet as characteristic of, or even definitive, of Spanish dance. So without venturing an opinion about which came first, the chicken or the egg, and Teresa can tell us about you know, the 1950s, um, we would simply note that along with these intricate heel and toe interlacings, these jumps are found in representations of Spanish folk dance today, notably the Basque dances. This is Pedro Azorín. Yeah, that's the Jota. Um, our next source for the Villano comes from the 1820 treatise by bolero dancer Antonio Cairón. Thank you. <laughs> Cairón calls the Villano a dance that accompanies its music by hitting the hands together and hitting the hands alternately on the feet and sometimes on the ground. One adopts various postures traveling from one spot to another and sometimes seated on the ground the feet are lifted in a sort of spasm of anger, patalatilla. This dance belongs to the laborers of the village, for that reason it is called Villano. Cairón also addresses Zapateado in his 1820 treatise, but in relation to the Canario, rather than the Villano. The Canario came from the Canary Islands. It was later called Guaracha, and lately Zapateado. The name might change again soon, but the form will not. That is, Cairón sees the Guaracha as a footwork dance, like the Canario and Zapateado. In 1836, the same year that Thomas Rice took his Jim Crow Act to London, 
Doña María Requejo, Danz La Guaracha, a Teatro del Diorama en Habana. Caidón, in 1820, called the Guaracha a footwork dance. Thank you. I think I have to go a little lower. But Cassiano Pellicer's 1804 history of Spanish theater calls the Guaracha a lively and dangerous descendant of the Sarabanda, that scandalous dance described in 1583 as representing in public the most stupid and dirty acts that are done in bordellos, representing kisses and embraces and everything else with the mouth and arms, thighs and the whole body, in other words, a dance of sexual pantomime. In Luis Misson's 1761 Tonadilla de los Negros, a Neglita Gitana, a little black gypsy, and her companions, a black man and a white woman, all three characters are played by white actresses in drag, bailan con taconeo, that is, they dance with heel work. And you can see here, I don't know if my, yeah, okay. You, the bailan con taconeo, and you can see here, neglo and negla, Writing neg neglo instead of negro is a centuries-old convention for representing African-accented Spanish. It's a representation of blackness. And you should check out Nick, Nick Jones' new uh, book on black talk. Um, it's interesting, though, because in villano representations, a dramatic device for showing the epiphany of this villano is that he comes on speaking in correct Spanish, or Sayagüez, and he ends up, after he gets his epiphany, he ends up speaking correct Spanish. The tonadilla employs a curious word, huachi, as a, an affectionate reference to the beloved. In flamenco today, this would be gitana mia, primo mio de mi alma, negra mi negra. This says, Neglita gitana guachi, que me robas el alma guachi. Little black gypsy girl, guachi, you have stolen my soul, guachi. RAE gives the derivation of guachi, which can also be spelled guachi, and you see now we're getting a little closer to the word guaracha, as the Chilean quechua guacha or guachu, which means an orphan or illegitimate child. In his Glossario de Afronegrismos, or a glossary of African Spanish words, the eminent musicologist Fernando Ortiz adds that the word huaricha, now we're really close to huaracha, which he thinks must have been spread by the colonizers, means in Colombia a detestable delicacy. RAE adds that in Colombia and Ecuador, huaricha is a synonym for rabona, a female camp follower, and in Venezuela, a young single Indian woman. In other words, the Huarachas on the 18th century Spanish stage seem to be of mis mixed African and Native American heritage. Ruiz Mayordomo says that they represented the exotic from the Spanish perspective, the new world of the Indies and the Caribbean. In her article on dance in the 18th century tonadillas, Ruiz Mayordomo discusses the huaracha sung by the famous tonadillera Maria Antonia Fernandez La Caramba. Ay huacharita, que huachara estas, que tu huacharo des huacharza. Ay little huachara, how huachara you are. Your huachara, huacharo does the huachara to you. <laughs> <laughs> Try to say that 10 times in a row, right? Ruiz Mayordomo explains the double entendre working here. The author here is making a play on words, alternating the term huacharo, which may mean an orphan, as we saw, or a small animal, but in this context means crybaby or whiner, with eshuachar or eshuazar, which is to ford a river. That is, Cairón in 1820 tells us that the huaracha is a footwork dance, the bailan con taconeo that we find in Misón's 1761 Tonadilla de los Negros. But Pericet in 1804 links the huaracha to the sexual pantomime of the 16th century Sarabanda. And that certainly seems to be the implication of these 18th century huaracha performances of young, vulnerable, exotic, and sexually available women. As Robert Ferris Thompson explains, in the Bakunao dances, the intent is to emphasize life, 
the opposition of male and female is a sign that the world cannot exist without marriage. That ideal communion is dramatized by the striking of hip against hip and abdomen against abdomen. Standing at the crossroads between life and death, Elegua is the perfect balance of nature, a combination of opposites, like young and old, destructive and constructive. He balances on one foot as he dances. He is the choice that changes man's relationship with the world, making the impossible possible. Cuban musicologist Alejo Carpentier describes these suggestive dances as a vast and motley family, close of kin to the Sarabon, mentioned by the poets of the Spanish Golden Age, always accompanied by the lifting of the, the lifting of the kicking of the apron and the gesture of the lifted skirt, the choreographed pursuit of the female by the male. The latter is an eternal basis and theme of the fandango. And I'll just sort of quickly mention that those of you that know my work from my Sonidos art article in, tw in 2014 and from the, the conference proceedings of the last conference, I argue that in the Sevianas that we all dance, the pasada, which is a, ch which is a step of changing places and which can become very flirtatious if you want it to be and can even become a chase if you repeat it over and over again like we do in the, fourth, the last section of the first copla, for example. Um, I argue, and it, of course, this is, also the quintessential step as we, as we discussed in our uh, proceedings from last time, the pasada is also the quintessential step of the 18th century fandango. It's what makes the 18th century fandango so sexy, right? So my argument is that this pasada is a manifestation of these, this Bakunao movement complex in Spain. In the original Spanish, Carpentier's kicking of the apron is punta pie al delantal. That is, the Bakunao's kicking gesture has the same name as the villano kick. And we've seen the punta pie al delantal in Spain as well. For example, in an entremes from 1643, the heroine dances to this verse, que brillosas pan saliendo, o que bien bailando van, dando al aire castañetas y puntapies al delantal, how breezily they come out, oh how well they go off dancing, giving castanets to the air and kicks to the apron. So we wonder about, um, I'm just gonna clip this, so I can use my hands. We wonder about the uptake of the huaracha as it returned again to the Iberian Peninsula in the 18th century as a sexy representation of dark-skinned America. We agree with Elizabeth Le Guin's brilliant discussion of the Mandingoy in her Tonadilla book that the Guaracha's wobbly and slippery representations of race let give us the sense of precariousness and longing that a declining and utterly dependent Spain might have felt toward its rising and soon to be independent colonies. In that regard, Considering the Bakunao as responding to the highest spiritual and political imperatives of those enslaved throughout the diaspora, and that is to deny objection and genocide generation after generation, and to affirm the unbreakable continuity and strength of their lineage generation after generation. We wonder whether in the Huarachas oscillations of identity between Gitana Negra and Amerindian, Amerindian the Negra Gitana Huachi, like the uh, teetering between sacred and profane love and desire that is the essence of the Bakunao, and also like the Villano teetering between redemption, he's the shepherd, he's the good shepherd, and he's the, ca the cabriole, he's the goat, he's the devil. And of course, the whole fun of the Villano representation, what made him so, so popular through so many centuries, was that he comes bumbling out onto the stage, he's drunk, he's, he's telling dirty jokes and you know, talking about how much he wants to eat and drink and stuff like that. And the audience were trying to figure out, is he gonna get it that that's the Christ child? Is he gonna get that the Christ child has been born? And that's the narrative. In his, eight, in his 1934 history of Mexican music, eminent musicologist Gabriel Sardivar explained that Afro-Mexican music and dance followed the routes that those enslaved were forced to travel. Saldivar published from his personal collection the earliest guaracha that we know of, which is a guaracha by Juan García de, Cés de Céspedes, chapel master of the cathedral in Puebla, which is dated in 1674. Would you do me a favor and turn lights off? 
This beautiful song is a Christmas carol. And here's one of our favorite interpretations by Fahmi Alkai, who is a Palestinian Spaniard, Arcangel, who is a famous flamenco singer, and soprano Marivi Blanco. And of, and of course, you know, the, the cabrioles are part of the, the grotesco or the comique, you know, which is the character dancer. So it's not the noble dancer, it's the character dancer that does these cabrioles. You know, I want to just say that, and this is something I was I was thinking about listening to the, um, the the presentations from earlier. You know, this kind of the way that some people come to flamenco as, you know, maybe supplementing um, uh, an an idiom. You know, supp supplementing what they're doing in their idiom, um, like these uh, these jaraneros uh, de Nueva York. Um, and people are always drawn to flamenco because of the image of the power of the woman. That's what people love about flamenco. That's what I love about flamenco. So, you know, while it's true that, you know, it's, it's very, um, it's very uh, what do you call it, D split gender-wise, flamenco tends to be very split gender-wise. You know, the man has his style and the woman has his, her style and never the twain shall meet. Um, but certainly, as a soloist, the flamenco dancer has the opportunity to be very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Uh, we 
just sent those to, those oh, links to me in an email. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm to figure it out though. Yeah. And then Dr. Shea, thank you so much for your your presentation. I, I want to just reinforce that, that my interest in cultural anthropology and ethnography and ethnohistory. Uh, I think the idea of, of what you're saying in terms of uh, dance as an expression and the constant evolution of it. Um, I want to I want to relate it to language and, and just remind people that it is a cultural expression of the culture of that moment. So regardless of the etymology of the terms used to describe it, it that should be our, our only driving force um, in, in looking for the support that's that looking for those um, pieces that, that bring that current dance together. Thank you all. Um, fascinating work. Um, all of you, I, I really enjoyed it. But um, I wanted to um, say that uh, you work on the Guaracha and El, El Villano and all that. Uh, it it is it's like a pass. It's a piece of the puzzle that I was always uh, wondering about because I, reading Faustino Nunez, he always mentioned the Guaracha and the Habanera and the Tango Americano or Baile de Negros. As, as part of the evolution into what later on became el tango flamenco and the tientos. Um, the thing is, um, the habanera is in a 4-4 four, four form, but then these dances were in 6-8, or were like ternary. Yeah, so can I jump in there? Yeah, I, and I want to say one thing. This is also for you, Constance, just to say, because you may not know this, but um, probably a lot of other people do know that the Huaracha, of course, in Cuba becomes blackface. It becomes the Cuban answer to blackface. So, it, yeah. So, just putting that out there. Yeah. Also, yeah. also uh, all these audience of Cuscus, they have the tanguillo, the 6 a Right. So, Right, so the, so to answer the, the, your second question, Alfonso, that was actually something we were thinking about because, of course, we're all very enamored of the 6-8. And the villano, the canario does have that 6-8. It has the gemiola, but the villano does not. The villano is, is in 4-4 in four four or something like that. But we decided, we were actually looking, what, what was it? We were looking at, um, I don't know, we decided to ignore uh, this problem. But, but the other thing... Um, yeah, part of the part of our rationale for ignoring the issue of rhythm was because um, yeah, we we really had a lot of this kind of th this kind of information that was coming from the words and the descriptions. So we wanted to s stay with that, but um, and there just wasn't you know obviously we went on way too long as it is. Um, but the other piece of it is that like I'm studying um, Afro Caribbean percussion right now and. My teacher can just take a 6-8, and he can just morph it into a somewhere middle tanguillo sort of thing, and he can morph it back to a 4, and then morph it right back. And it's like he doesn't really even see it as, you know. Um, so just to say that, and like there's, I have a great quote from Winter, Winton Marsalis, which I think I might have played at that 2012 chord conference, where he, he talks about swing in American music, and he, he takes it from, you know, American music swing to all the way to the African club and back again, you know, so kind of through the Cuban and then to the African and back. So it's, it, I, we decided that there's a, a spread there in terms of the rhythm, yeah. I mean, Elegua is, um, in my limited understanding, and I know people in this room know a lot more about this than I do, so I hope that you will correct me where I get into shit. Um, but, um, and now I'll pick up the microphone now. Um, my understanding is that um, Elegua is one of the divinities in these many um, African 
Africanist religious practices in the diaspora that can be danced with a, a game of sexual pantomime or can have those kind of um, pantomimic movements. And of course, you know, uh, this one was talking about a legua also, you know, there's Gede in the, in the Haitian tradition and Banda, but, you know, I don't really know anything about any of this. I, I just come to this as a complete novice and someone who's interested and trying to be respectful, you know, m above all. <laughs> Well, I mean, so I, I'm like eternally writing this chapter on the 18th century, heaven forbid. Um, and, you know, one of the things about the 18th century is that, you know, with the change of regime in Spain, the change of dynasty, there's this constant kind of oscillation between like talking about these popular dances and music forms and theater itself as being like, okay, you know, we're, we're going to demonstrate our Spanishness here, and then, oh, no, no, this is like going to send you to hell. Well, okay, and, and the times when theater, when theater performances were prohibited, a lot of these villancicos took refuge in the churches. So they really did move back and forth, according to a lot of the sources that I've been reading. I'm a senior dancer, <laughs> but um, and I just wanted to make a comment because you mentioned the Sevillanas, and I've seen many Sevillanas, I've danced many Sevillanas, and relating it to Elegua. And um, my husband and I, we had put on a, um, a, a feria de Sevilla, and there were like a hundred people there, and they were um, there was this one couple from Cadiz. And when they danced the Sevianas, it was the first time, I mean, it was breathtaking. It was so beautiful and so sexy, yeah. And it was like, there was no pantomime, but it felt like 
Wow. <laughs> they should have been in a bedroom someplace else because it was so sensual. And I've seen other Savianas that it was passionate, but it wasn't as sensual as, the, as this um, couple that did the Savianas. So I can imagine also going back maybe to the Saraban because, um, you know, how was it danced, you know? And I'm trying to just imagine it. And actually there was a, um, the, she's from um, Vienna. She's a, um, an old school, um, she has a, um, an academy in um, Vienna. Academy. Yeah, academia, but a, Liberal. Right, and I remember seeing her on a video, and she and she was going to dance a tango, and I think Miguel Poveda, Poveda, he, he was singing, and she said to. Are you talking about Lupi? Oh, please, uh, perdón me. You know, I have, I'm going to dance this, and this is like, um, you might not understand it, but it's the sarabanda. Uh -huh. You know, and she was saying but excuse my movements that I'm going to do. <laughs> and I think we probably, I don't know, I, have, I don't have my schedule in front of me, so um, please help me uh, it, okay. not lose I, control of time. It, it says 11.30 break, and then we come back to 11.40. So, oh, awesome. I, okay. so I think we're okay, and then Adam looks like he's ready to stand. So, because, yeah. this is so fascinating, I don't want to <laughs> stop it super early. Can we take another one? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Well, great. A phenomenal presentation and, 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 and really fascinating. I'm just wondering whether you have plans in your ongoing research to delve even further back and look at the Villancico from, let's say, uh, pre Columbian Spain to look at Juan de la, de la Encina's Villancicos and so on. And what kind of a line you might draw between that body of work and then the more modern meaning of the term. Well, I mean, um, as I was saying to Benjamin, you know, I, my whole, when I heard his presentation on the medieval serranillas, it took me on to this whole um, really interesting uh, exploration of the Pastor Bobo, um, who is, you know, in these medieval, you know, you know, autos and these medieval representations of the Pastor is, He's, all the outlines of this character are there, and um, you know, speaking of competition, like I, I'm interested in, I'm not quite sure how this is all going to fit together, but I'm interested in the, you know, the the fiesta de moros y cristianos, these kind of uh, staged battles between the Moor and the Christian, because you know, my my uh, one of my central assertions in my book is that you know, Spain is the 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 seedbed of these you know early of these, of our ideas about race right now. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, it starts out against the Jews and the Muslims in, you know, the pre-Columbian period, and then it gets transposed with the, ad, with the advent of the Atlantic slave trade and the discovery of the Americas and the colonization of Americas. You know, <coughs> Spain um, takes this idea of purity of blood and transposes it onto you know kind of what we would think of as race and um, yeah so yeah I guess I, I just made a, I'm, I was so interested in your in some of the linguistic connections you were making and and like Wachi if it's a Quechua word it seems like that e at the end is this possessive like huh. my personal possess possessive form so this is Ah, yeah. Okay. Which he directly cites Guaraches. 
Okay, yeah. The, the origin of the word. That's the first thing. Second thing is this. Being a Latin American, <laughs> every time we look at the Real Academia de la Lengua, the dictionary, mm. it's always wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Basically, their language seems to be Madrid and it's surrounded. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, you guys, please um, help help me not put my foot in shit. Yeah. The word sambo means in Andalusia bow leg. Uh huh. Uh -huh. So sambo also is, could be that. It's got dual meanings too. Right, so. Right. No, there's, uh, that's, I'm so on, no, I'm so with you about, I'm sorry, I'm so with this. I'm so with you about the, um, the conflation of the Roma, that's, yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. The conflation of the Roma, you know, the, the Roma become the blacks for Spain, you know, that's what happens. Oh, his name is Nick Jones. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Right. <laughs> 